Hello everybody, welcome back, Dang Teach at CCSD. Today we're going to cover common drugs and their usage. This is a four-part series. We're going to cover quite a bit of drug classes. So if this is your first time joining us, welcome to the community. And if you've been here before, welcome back. Let's begin. So we'll describe drug names, classifications. We'll take a look at common brand and generics. In this one, we'll just do analgesics or pain relievers uh, for this part. Chemical names. So the chemical name of a drug will give it specific structural information. So for example, this molecule here, all the connections are in a particular way, in and out of the plane. So its chemical name is N-acetylparaaminophenol. So this gives you all the different structural information of the compound. So don't worry about the different parts, what they mean. Just know that every single thing tells you where things are connected. So if you want that exact 3D structure, then you'll give it the chemical name. However, the chemical name might be way too big to use in everyday conversation. And it's more information than we would ever need. So we have generic names. So generic names are official. Anytime you use a generic name, we know the exact chemical structure of the compound we're referring to. So these are adopted by USAN Council. And again, they are official. So the generic name for this compound is acetaminophen. And you can see how they shorten the chemical name acetamin, right? So they just they just um, shorten the chemical name. So sometimes generic names are still really long and complex. So we'll sell it under the brand name. So the brand name, proprietary name, or trademark name all means the same thing. Uh, since it is a proper noun, usually brand names are capitalized, whereas generic names are lowercase. And for Tylenol, you can also see where they came up with that name. Here is the Thai part, and here is the enol part. So they shorten the chemical name even more. Drug classes. So drug classes are not official because one compound can actually be in many drugs. And a lot of drugs that are already used will actually be researched for a different use. One way to recognize drugs easily is to learn the stems or the root of the medication name. So for example, drugs ending in OLOL are beta blockers, atenolol, propanolol. Drugs that end in pril are ACE inhibitors. So ACE inhibitors are angiotensin converting enzyme inhibitor. So the compound angiotensin will cause your blood vessels to tense up or constrict. So if you ever block that action, then you don't get the constriction. Sartin drugs are angiotensin II antagonists. They work, they work very similar to ACE inhibitors. Classification schemes. So usually they're named based on the body system that they affect, uh, the receptor or neurotransmitter that they interact with, and the type of action, whether it's an agonist or an antagonist. The nervous system, for example, we have the parasympathetic and the sympathetic nervous system. So the sympathetic nervous system upregulates your body. That's included in the flight or flight response, whereas parasympathetic is going to stimulate rest and digest. So they work op opposite of each other to keep your body in balance. And homeostasis just means to stay. Stay at that same spot 
and hopefully it's in balance. So the neurotransmitter that's used for the parasympathetic nervous system is acetylcholine. So anything that acts like it are cholindric agents. Anything that blocks it are going to be anti-cholindric agents. The sympathetic nervous system uses adrenaline, aka epinephrine. So that comes from the adrenal medulla. So it's an androgenic, meaning that it came from the adrenal gland. So drugs that are similar to, or sorry, drugs that stimulate the sympathetic nervous system are androgenic. And if it blocks it, then they're anti-anergetic. So you can think of the analogy we use. The parasympathetic nervous system is like the brake pedal. And the sympathetic nervous system is like the gas pedal. If you activate this guy, we slow down. If you activate this guy, we speed up. If you block this guy, we speed up. And if you block this guy, we slow down. Agonists. So agonists will mimic the action of uh, the drug that activates the receptor or the chemical that activates the receptor. So they're mimics. Whereas antagonists will block, and they'll ne normally be called blockers, like uh, beta blockers. They might have a lytic action or anti. So that just means they're antagonists. They're against activating the receptor. Other drugs will affect neurotransmitter. Uh, serotonin, that's responsible in your pleasure center for uh, SSRIs. They'll prevent serotonin from being depleted in the environment. Uh, dopamine, if you have Parkinson's, we can modulate dopamine to help stop the tremors. Histamine, uh, usually for that allergy response, uh, GABA, uh, tons of other ones, endorphins, some natural, some synthetic as well. All right, let's review. Which type of drugs end in pril? Those are going to be the ACE inhibitors. How about the Sartin drugs? So the Sartin drugs are similar to ACE inhibitors. They act on angiotensin. Statin drugs. I don't think I gave you this one. So process of elimination, those are going to be MG-CoA reductase inhibitor. So this is for cholesterol. If you have high cholesterol, we're going to block your body's ability to make it. And lastly, things that end in OLOL, those are going to be our beta blockers. Drug classifications are official under USAN Council. True or false? This statement is going to be false. So USAN is for generics and drug classifications are always changing or expanded. All right, we'll go through our first class of drugs, analgesics. So ana is without, algia is pain. So these drugs will block the pain. So I have a question for you. Is pain real? Well, regardless if it's real or not, is it necessary? Well, initially, yes. Uh, when you get an injury, it's a good way to tell your body or tell you not to use that part of the body or to tell you that that part is injured. You may want to get it checked out. But once you get the message, you're not going to need that prolonged chronic pain. So just keep that in mind. Is pain real? Is it necessary? So here are the types we'll discuss. We have our salicylics. Those are the aspirin-like uh, drugs, mild to moderate pain. We have Tylenol. It's in its own class, mild to moderate pain. NSAIDs, the non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs. And then for severe pain, we have our opiates and our opioids. Opioids are just synthetically uh, manufactured opiate-type drugs. So our first class will be the salicylics. So that's the aspirin class. They come from the bark of the willow plant. And the way it works is it acts on the Cox enzyme, 
that produces prostaglandin. Prostaglandin is a paracrine hormone, so it's a localized hormone. So if you bump your knee, you only want your knee to swell up. You don't want your arms or your head to swell up. So it only works locally. It's easier for us to synthesize aspirin, acetylsalicylic acid from wintergreen oil, than trying to make salicylic acid. It has the properties of the three A's. It reduces pain. And since it works at the site by blocking Cox enzyme, it reduces inflammation, the injury response, and also reduces fever. However, aspirin should not be used in young children because of Rye's disease, causing um, water on the brain, hydroencephaly, leading to coma, brain damage, and death. Non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs. So these are not steroids. I'm not talking about anabolic steroids. I'm talking about cortical steroids, steroids from your adrenal cortex that help you reduce inflammation. So these are non-steroidal type. They're going to work on the COX enzyme, and there are certain NSAIDs that can specifically target COX-1 or the COX-2 enzyme, hopefully leading to less side effects. Again, working on the production of prostaglandins. So a couple common examples, ibuprofen and naproxen. They do have the 3A properties because it works at the site of pain on COX enzyme. So you'll have pain relief, inflammation relief, and fever relief. Unlike aspirin or non steroidal anti-inflammatory drug, uh, Tylenol is kind of in its own class. It only has the two A's. It does reduce pain and it does reduce fever. However, Tylenol does not work at the site of pain to prevent Cox enzyme from making prostaglandins. Tylenol works by changing your perception of pain. So it kind of works in your head instead of at the site of pain. So again, I ask you, is pain real? What is the maximum daily dose for Tylenol for healthy adults? It's going to be 3000 milligrams. If you're elderly or have, I'll see, liver function, liver problems, then you may want to avoid Tylenol altogether or reduce your intake. And then lastly, we have the opiate type that are for severe pain. And much like Tylenol, they're going to alter your perception of pain and they work like endorphins. So endorphins are natural neural chemicals, neurotransmitter in your brain that act just like um, opioids. They can be addictive. They give you a euphoric effect. And many of these opiate types are going to be C2 medication. So how many refills can you get for a C2 prescription? Of course, that question is zero refills. And when does that C2 prescription expire? So it's going to expire seven days from the day it was written. All right, that concludes the first part of this four-parter. Uh, we just touch on analgesic. Part two coming up next, we'll cover um, the other A's, anti-infectives and anti-neoplastic agents next time. Thank you for joining me and hopefully you have a wonderful day.